Yeah. Uh, welcome to the first session of Cambridge Economics Club presents Cambridge Account Festival 2022. This is funded by Global Pluralistic Economics Training Program by Exploring Economics. Today we have uh, the most honorable person uh, who is an inspiration to every econo economics kid uh, from Kerala, uh, especially from Kerala. Um, and I wish to uh, welcome him uh, to, to, uh, to the talk and to introduce him, I wish to welcome Atori Devika, uh, one of our co-founders. Hello, everybody. It is now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the day, Alex M. Thomas, sir. Alex M. Thomas, sir, teaches economics at Azim Premji University, Bangalore, India. He studied economics at universities of Madras, Hyderabad, and Sydney. His book, Macroeconomics and Introduction, has been published by Cambridge University Press. His primary research interest is in uh, economic thought, history of economic thought, with a special focus on classical political economy. His co-edited book, Pluralist Economics and Its History, was published by Ruth Ledge in 2019. His research in the history of economic thought has been published in various national and international journals, including the uh, Economic and Political Weekly, European Journal of the History of Economic Thought, History of Economic Ideas, and Journals of Interdisciplinary Economics. Alex has been blogging on economics topics, particularly the history of economic thought, macroeconomics, Indian economy, and the methodology of economics since 2006. Uh, we have this session planned in uh, session planned in three parts. First, Alex will give a brief introduction about his book, followed by another twenty minutes. Uh, we'll have some pre-prepared questions, which we uh, we had prepared based on reading his book. Uh, that that the questions will be discussed in the ne the next twenty minutes, and after that, we'll open the floor to your questions. So kindly keep on dropping in the questions which you have. Uh, welcome, Alex. Uh, kindly. Yeah, uh, thanks so much, uh, Vinayak and uh, Devika Yara, uh, and thanks so much, uh, KN Raj Economics uh, Club, for inviting me here. Uh, so let me just—I have a few slides, uh, and maybe I'll talk for about twenty minutes or so. So I'm going to uh, talk about my book, uh, set it in context, and then uh, take questions. So to begin, I think it's important uh, for me to sort of talk about the present state of macroeconomics education. And I think that uh, most, most of us uh, who study or who teach macroeconomics, there are strong marginalist micro foundations to it. And one of the reasons I mentioned that is because if you take macroeconomics today, the dominant way to explain Unemployment seems to be either of the two, and they're interrelated as well. And this is what is called an imperfectionist approach. That is, either imperfect competition is seen to be what is causing unemployment. So this could be because of some kind of wage rigidity or some kind of asymmetric information. So, and these, if you look at the perfect competition version, they have, they are coming out of this marginalist economics or neoclassical economics. And if you take the state of education of macroeconomics, the way in which we somehow think of it is what you have at PhD level or at uh, the frontiers of whatever people are working on is mainstream macroeconomics. And then the way in which macroeconomics is taught in PhD is to prepare one to deal with these mainstream uh, macroeconomic issues. Intermediate textbooks are written keeping in mind the advanced textbooks and introductory textbooks are written keeping in mind the intermediate textbook. So in this manner, what is happening here is really that people who are working in the mainstream of the tradition are influencing the textbooks all the way up to the introductory level. And I think that here it is important for me to point out that not everyone who studies a BA in economic or an MA in economics will go on to do a PhD. And so therefore, we need to really think about our textbooks and the material that we use in our classrooms a bit more critically. And I think that this 
from an educational standpoint uh, is rather impoverished because everything cannot be reduced to or the our benchmark cannot be what is dominating our profession today especially when there are multiple schools of thought that is one reason and the other reason i call it educationally impoverished is because people take up economics for various reasons and many of them might not do a phd in economics the kind of framework that i follow in my book is to talk about the fact that there exists multiple theories in particular two uh, large schools of thought i highlight the context uh, and what i'm writing about is the indian context and i then discuss a little bit about accounting or measurement because when i'm talking about measurement it is in, i bring in both theory as well as context and then putting all these together i talk about so there is some kind of a policy discussion of a general nature and again when i'm talking about any kind of textbook uh, be it my own i think it's important that i spend some time talking about the nature of knowledge in economics and the dominant view seems to be the following that ricardo is an advance over smith marx is an advance over ricardo samuelson is an advance over marshall and uh, the textbook that we have today it could be mancu or someone else's or variance book is an advance over all these kind of views and what this seems to suggest is that it is enough for me to just read my textbook it is not important for me to read any of these ideas or thinkers that came before me but ideas do not evolve in such a linear fashion there is no reason to presume that the textbook that we read today contains everything that is good in all the previous thinkers and everything that is bad also because there are contending schools of thought and as i mentioned one is that there are contending paradigms and two there are always political considerations for why one school of thought might be dominant from the other and these political considerations of course involve not just the general political climate but also how universities are structured and how they function i think the fact or one of the characteristics of knowledge of human knowledge is that there have always existed contending standpoints when ricardo is writing ricardo is in a debate with jb say about his theory of value although he has he approves of says a uh, law of markets so contending standpoints can is visible from as far as when smith is writing or other thinkers are writing but the way in which i treat these two schools of thought in the book are as follows so smith ricardo marx keynes rafa john robinson all in one tradition and people like uh, bentham jb say marshall walrus samuelson and others in a different tradition the first tradition largely can be called as the classical marxian keynesian tradition or strafian tradition and the second what i'm calling the marginalist school of thought just as a kind of overview or a recap for many of you who might have forgotten this or are recently studying this and i think this is at the core of it that marginalist economic theory provides a theory of price and it provides a subjective theory of value which is based on some kind of utility or marginal utility and this is based on consumer preferences technology and endowments they also have a theory of income distribution uh, which under conditions of perfect competition is based on the marginal productivity theory of income distribution which says that under conditions of competition in equilibrium your real wage equals the marginal product of labor and rate of profit equals the marginal product of capital and these two kind of what i consider to be fundamental ideas or economic theories are employed in several kind of areas within economics this could be in economic growth for instance if you look at uh, the growth theory of solo or romer uh, you will find these kind of ideas there the marginal productivity theory there in trade theories and environmental theories and labor economics it's and also when one is working on econometric studies these uh, the subjective theory of value and some notion of marginal productivity theory does find 
a mention. So, although today I think that the rise of econometric studies is meant that people don't talk too much about economic theory, but I strongly think that these are lurking in the background because all or most economists, 99% or more of economists are trained in marginalist economic thought. Now, what about the classics or what I call in my book as uh, classical economics, which is the alternative that I propose? So this refers to books like uh, Tableau Economic by Kenney, Smith's Wealth of Nations, uh, Principles of Political Economy by Ricardo, um, Marxist Capital. What is unique about them is that I think that they're completely entrenched in the context. So for instance, Kenney is writing about the French economy. Right? Marx is talking about Britain and Europe in general. And what we find in all their work is that there are rich descriptions. And in a way, one can say that there's a lot of empirical uh, information because they are making reference to several kinds of data, several kinds of descriptions of what is happening in their uh, surroundings. The logical structure of their theories are very different from marginalist economics. And this is often highlighted in courses like classical political economy or history of economic thought. Of course, I must pause here and uh, add this kind of a qualifier that it is possible to teach history of economic thought in a linear approach. That is, it is possible to teach it as a marginalist economic thought being a scientific advance over classical political economy. Now, that kind of a pedagogic approach to me is flawed because I think that what really exists and has been existing is contenting schools of thought. The other important aspect in the classics is the idea of free competition or what is sometimes called the long period method. And this is not to say that whatever is there in Smith or Ricardo can be directly applied to all contexts. What happens under conditions of free competition, that is has a universal appeal to it. But these are not things that can be readily applied. Although in the past, people have tried to apply, let's say, Smith's uh, theory to the Indian context, or people have misused, I would say, or misinterpreted Smith and used them in the colonial context, but they cannot really be readily applied. And I think that it's important that uh, we keep in mind that the theoretical world does not e easily correspond to the actual world. And when we are moving from theory to policy making, one has to be extremely cautious, whether one is working in the mainstream tradition or in the alternative tradition. Now, I think one of the uh, parts of the book that I want to highlight is that, so what I have on the left is really just an image of uh, the a review of my book, which was published in Economic and Political Weekly. And one of the things is uh, most people who are working within the heterodox tradition are also not very aware of this kind of a synthesis between classical political economy and the work of Keynes and Kalitsky, or more specifically, the synthesis between Strafa and Keynes. So I had uh, written a response to this review trying to articulate what is the essential characteristics or why it is possible to fuse classical economics and Keynes. And here, some, I mean, one of the resistance or one of the reasons why people are maybe a bit cautious about this or unclear about this is because in Keynes's book, the initial chapter is a criticism of classical economics. But Keynes's definition of classical economics is problematic because it is not an analytical definition. According to Keynes, anyone who wrote before him or even contemporaries like Marshall and Pigou, he considers them to be classical economics. So the kind of definition that I adopt in my book, and I clarify this uh, in the book, is that it is an analytical definition and not a chronological definition as Keynes would do. And this has led to all kinds of confusion as to what classical economics is. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, by classical economics, I'm referring to the economics of Kenney, uh, Smith, Ricardo, Marx. So if this kind of a, because of this Rafa Keynes kind of synthesis, I believe that it's possible perhaps to call it classical Keynesian political economy. And 
in a way in which uh, uh, marx because marx is also using social classes as a fundamental unit of analysis it's possible to also bring him within this fold and in uh, my book i also propose a different kind of growth theory from the mainstream again this is uh, not novel to my work but this is a tradition that i've been working in which is demand led growth theory and the one of the building blocks of this is that classical slash sraffian theory of value and distribution which is to be found in sraffa's 1960 uh, book production of commodities by means of commodities and the theory of output which was put forth by kalitsky in 1933 and keynes in 1936 now i'm calling it keynesian and kalitskyan because even in keynes there are certain marginalist elements so demand led growth theory removes those marginalist elements and fuses sraffian theory of value and distribution with the keynesian theory of output and there are many people who today who work in this tradition and as i mentioned i think it's also important that i highlight that keynes's intellectual opponents were marshall and pigou first and foremost that those were his intellectual opponents and not adam smith or marx or other classical economists although in the context of ricardo there there has been a discussion but if one is interested we can come back in the q and a so when i talk about this kind of an approach that i bring together theory context measurement and policy in a much more explicit way what i mean by pluralism in theory is that first i highlight marginalist economics or what is called orthodox economics i highlight the logical problems and i also talk about certain conceptual dissatisfactions that are present also methodological concerns right so there are i mean various kinds of criticisms have been raised at marginalist economics and i bring together some of them now within pluralism in theory i provide classical keynesian political economy as i uh, defined it earlier as the alternative to this and which can be largely considered as one of the heterodox schools the important point is that it recognizes structural power in society and there is a certain openness to history which is also important because there's a marginalist economics in a way does not recognize structural power in its core model it is not open to history and it is asocial because of the way uh, preferences are assumed to be whereas in classical keynesian political economy because of the analytical significance of the idea of social surplus and social classes the fact that there is power and it is organized in a hierarchical sense in the society is underscored as well as the structural interdependence between various classes or sectors is also highlighted so these are some of the key aspects which i think make it amenable and this can be applied in different contexts too and the context that i choose to explore is the indian one so what i'll do now is just give a brief of how i've tried to do it in uh, two kind of instances or how these two schools of thought might view inflation differently or actually i'm just going to look at the classical keynesian political economy uh, tradition because the general idea is some kind of a monetarist viewpoint that too much money supply is what uh, drives inflation but within the classical keynesian political economy and this might be familiar to many of those uh, who are working in the heterodox tradition which is that it is primarily arising from conflictual claims over income distribution and what i in my book i also highlight <coughs> fuel as well as um, the price of fuel especially and because and the price of agricultural commodities because depending on the degree of structural interdependence if there's an increase in the price of fuel it has cascading effects on uh, other parts of the economy so these two are what i highlight and therefore it is important that we study conceptually as well as empirically commodity flows of the leontief kind as well as money flows so the way in which i for instance this is just a illustration from my book where i try to um, where i was discussing how prices can be understood at different levels of abstraction uh, 
and when we are trying to study inflation we generally only look at the general price level which is of course defined for the economy as a whole at the macro level and when we are talking about uh, at the more micro approach uh, we are talking we also have individual prices of commodities but what is of interest to us is also relative prices how does the price of an agricultural commodity fair relative to a manufacturing commodity so i think that for us to have first a good grasp of inflation it is important that we also look at what determines relative prices and what is the political economy around it as well as individual prices and it's only when we have a fuller understanding of the link between let's say the relative price and the general price level can we start to then think of what kind of policy proposals might be relevant for our context because otherwise what happens is okay the general price level is rising and if people believe it is because of increase in money supply the kind of policy responses that are done to reduce money supply might not be appropriate in our context so i think that even for policy makers who are in monetary policy it is important they recognize that there are two schools of thought and there are two paradigms to understand inflation another this is the second part uh, which is to talk about growth the general way in which people understand growth is to think in terms of supply side growth theories uh, drawing on the work of solo uh, for instance the argument is that if there is a growth in technology and labor there will be economic growth there is also an implication in the supply side growth theories that there is a tendency to full employment now even somebody like romer all that uh, romer does is that he endogenizes technology uh, in the model all the most of the growth theories that have come after it have only looked at supply side growth theories and within demand led growth theories it is not that technology is always a good thing one needs to see what is the actual context and what is the nature of technology so the impact of technology and economic growth is actually contingent on that particular context and what really drives economic growth in this model is autonomous expenditures this could be private research and development it could be government spending in general but to create capacity uh, it could be building schools and hospitals it can also be exports which is uh, some kind of a foreign trade led growth so it is very clear from here that if people i mean people by people i'm not just referring to economists now but any person who tries to engage with questions of growth now there are many historians who also try to do that and often they are only exposed to supply side growth theory so therefore the kind of question they ask the kind of archival material that one looks up the kind of data that is collected all becomes narrowly defined or all becomes defined through the lens of supply side growth theory now i was looking at uh, this uh, person's smills book on growth which if you can see uh, he is writing about microorganisms to mega cities right and there is an idea of growth and i was just turning the pages a little to see what is you know uh, whether he has some understanding or where is his understanding of growth coming from and it is very evident that you know in a work like this too the growth theory that is being adopted is a supply side growth theory and in a very uncritical manner so in i think that it's important that Ac- um, academics or researchers not just restricted to economists but in general are made aware that there exists two different schools of thought to understand economic growth now i in my book i also talk a little bit about the indian context um, for instance i discuss the role of caste uh, the role of gender i also talk about uh, the question of informal sector and also how do we understand the village economy and so what i've put here is just taken a screenshot from the index to my book and also it is important that there is uh, in my book there's also some discussion on the nature of abstraction we talk about the dual economy the informal economy macro economy or the village economy but these are all abstractions and how do we understand them as abstractions and how do we uh, you make use of them to make sense of our surroundings the way in which i talk about theories and context uh, is to use the term concept uh, just because it sounds better next to context uh, 
and these are some of the books that i've recommended and i'll also recommend now which is to make better uh, sense of pluralism in economic theory i would recommend krishna bharadwaj's book themes in value and distribution kane raj's book organizational issues in, in indian agriculture again to understand the fact that india is largely still an agrarian economy and how do we understand indian agriculture better ambedkar's work on caste to understand structural power and how that operates i think this is recommended and i've also used different uh, kinds of fiction especially written uh, by uh, indian authors so this is just one example of it by p shivakami which was translated from the tamil title the taming of women and just a couple of slides and then i'll stop which is that i think all textbooks and it's important that we keep this in mind that all textbooks have a standpoint either it could be implicit or explicit in my book i've made my standpoint explicit what is it that i'm trying to do all textbooks either adopt a monist perspective or a pluralist perspective and i think that it's important that we we try to identify where these textbooks fall because that is a standpoint and that is a political and educational or pedagogic standpoint so for instance some of the books don't acknowledge that there exist different schools of thought and most textbooks don't do that and of course the textbook could be more orthodox or mainstream or it could be heterodox and i think this is why critical pedagogy is important that as students or as critical readers we are able to engage with multiple schools of thought we are also able to bring in the local context right so this is again a screenshot uh, from the front of my book or the back page where i take a problem setting approach as opposed to a problem solving one because who gets to decide what problems to set and and that should be coming out of the local context that should be coming out from the readers it should be coming out from the readers or the students as well as the teachers so critical pedagogy drawing on um, uh, the work of bell hooks and paulo freire if one is interested one can read that i think they also have a role to play where textbooks are critically interrogated including mine so concluding remarks uh, i think that it's important that we adopt and we acknowledge that there exists pluralism in both theory as well as in empirics uh, for instance in empirics uh, do we use econometrics do we use case studies do we use survey method do we use ethnographic method all these are different kinds of approaches and there is no reason to favor one over the other and it depends on our research question and certainly students should be exposed to the fact that there exist different kind of schools of thought in both theory and empirics and when it comes to critique in my book i have adopted two kinds of critique one which is conceptual i have conceptual dissatisfactions with marginalist economics and i raise contextual questions to classical political economy or the alternative one so critique i think has can be has to be both conceptual and contextual and i mentioned critical pedagogy but i think that it's important that the experience or the lived experience of each student also matters and the textbooks or the classroom pedagogy needs to have a way to accommodate them in some meaningful way so again this is the approach that i follow and because this is the approach that i follow i think that uh, sections of the book perhaps can also be used in courses on indian economic uh indian economy both generally economic theory and the theories of value and distribution so i'll stop here thank you thank you alex uh, for that presentation uh, uh like very briefly uh, but like including every important points um now i shall share the screen and like devika would uh, read out the questions uh, which our team has compiled after reading your book um Devika, could you please? Sure. So let's move on to the question and answer session on macroeconomics and introduction with Oda Alex and Thomas. Our first question is: 
Economics has evolved a long way from the era of mercantilism to present day economics. And there are two prominent approaches associated with the same, qualitative and quantitative. As a student of economics, I always find myself struggling to find the right balance between the same. What is a perfect or magic blend of the economic school of thought, which brings both qualitative and quantitative studies in equilibrium? This is from introduction, methodology. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Devika. Uh, so I, I think that I would think of it slightly maybe differently uh, and not try to think in terms of quantitative and qualitative. So for instance, uh, if I want to, if I'm, if one is interested in studying about how prices are determined, one, it is primarily a theoretical kind of uh, endeavor because we are going to assume some kind of competitive setting and then we are going to study uh, price theory. So this could be completely within the realm of theory where I would be reading, let's say, um, things written by Marx or things written by Marshall or things written by Strafa and then trying to explain it or trying to understand what determines prices. So one, I would largely categorize as it depends on what is it that we are trying to study. And secondly, when we come to the question of uh, methods or empirics, Again, I think that there are multiple ways to think about it. And even this qualitative quantitative might be might not be a very helpful kind of distinction because let's say that I'm doing an ethnographic uh, kind of research. Even there, I will be using certain quantitative. I mean, I will be making um, or understand, there will be some data that goes into quantitative data or numbers that go into it. So I think that there is both quantitative and qualitative which go together and it really depends on the nature of the question. And maybe I'll just make another point that today, unfortunately, I think that um, economics is largely driven by method. So if I want to study a particular problem, I might choose to read archival material, or I might choose to read some books that were published, or I might choose to do ethnographic work. But none of these are considered to be, or none of these fall within the mainstream economic method. Now to do the mainstream economic method, which will allow you to publish in certain top ranking journals, it, you might have to work on certain kinds of econometrics. Right? So what has happened is that Earlier, evidence was also plural. Now, why do we have, when we think of scientific evidence, we have to think in a pluralistic sense too. There is not just one kind of evidence because as human beings, as groups of human beings, we, are, we, are, we get convinced by multiple, kind of, uh, multiple kinds of sources and multiple kinds of argumentations. So there's not just one way to think of evidence. So there are different ways to understand causation. There are multiple schools of thought of causation. There are multiple ways to understand evidence. And there is no reason to think that there is a hierarchy that exists between, let's say, textual, archival, uh, um, ethnographic, or qualitative or quantitative. All these hierarchies are created by people who are in power and people who are in, uh, within the mainstream economic tradition. So I really think uh, this, I mean, to engage with this question and to resolve it for yourself, it is important that you engage with understanding how power exists within the academia. Power, that means who decides what gets published. So journal editors, economic associations, what are their views on what is the right method? And as you will also see, there are different kinds of journals that exist which allow different kind of methods to be used. So I think that it really depends on what you're interested in asking and uh, how you want to answer that question. Both are your choices. Thank you, sir. Next question is, the general price level, which is a bone of contention between many schools of thought, has been defined as an abstract term in the book. Can you explain the abstract nature of the general price level? This is from chapter two, which is based on political economy. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so let I just want to read out this quote from uh, Keynes, which I have uh, cited on page 36 uh, from the general theory. Uh, 
So Keynes writes and open quotes. The well-known but unavoidable element of vagueness, which admittedly attends the concept of the general price level, makes this term very unsatisfactory for the purposes of a causal analysis, which ought to be exact. And so I've just uh, cited some of the, these kinds of things to complicate this and to critically interrogate this idea of the general price level. So the general price level supposes that there exists something like P, uh, you know, which comes from the quantity theory of money. But what we see around us, I mean, none of us have ever seen the general price level. It is an abstract concept, just like the GDP that economists have invented to make sense of uh, ma the macro economy. But I think that in order to capture or to better understand inflation, it's important that we study individual prices as well as relative prices. Because the general price level alone, for instance, the general price level has a particular meaning in the quantity theory of money, which is coming from the monetarist tradition. The, if somebody goes and looks at something like the Leontief input-output or Srafa's theory of prices, you find multiple prices. You don't find the idea of the general price level. right? So I think that it's still open-ended as to how one wants to think about how you're going to connect relative prices, a matrix of relative prices, to the idea of a singular general price level. And very often we take these things for given and we might not critically interrogate it. But I think that depending on the school of thought that you come from, it's possible to interrogate this and make sense of it because it. I think that it has been used uh, in a very uncritical fashion. So next question is from chapter one, new economic thing, uh, which is based on new economic thinking. The book illustrates a new branch of economy called mesoeconomics. Can you tell us what is the scope of the branch of mesoeconomics and how is it different from macro and microeconomics? Uh, so when I was uh, writing this book on macroeconomics, I mean, I also had to decide how much of, let's say, how much of abstraction or how much of detail or I wanted to get into. And I realized that if I'm going to talk about the context, it is important that I get into some kind of sector specific details, like the contribution of agricultural sector, manufacturing sector, service sector or to get into some kind of gender-based uh, classification, which are all, uh, to me, of a lower order of abstraction than the macro level. And then you also have individual prices, uh, individual commodities, but there is something which exists between the macro and the micro, which is what I've called mesoeconomics, just so that, I mean, it's consistent with our use of the terms macro and meso. It's not entirely novel because this kind of an idea can also be found in some some ways in the input output kind of framework. It can also be found in what is called structural macroeconomics. So some version of it is there, but I've just used a different term for it, uh, which sticks better with both these. And similarly, I think that when we are studying macroeconomics, it's important we also pay attention to the structure of economic growth, the structure of employment, understood in different ways and also see how it connects to maybe the individual setting. I think only then we'll have a better understanding of macroeconomics. And by understanding, I'm talking about the scope or the limits of macroeconomics itself. The next question is from chapter four, which is based on Austrian economics. The book details the shift of economics from methodological holism to methodological individualism. Do you think that when economics starts focusing more on methodological individualism, the relevance of studies such as political economy, Marxian economy, maybe in a broader sense, macroeconomics is fading? Yeah, so I think that uh, I do sp uh, speak a little bit about uh, methodological holism and methodological individualism. And I think that this uh, first, uh, first and foremost is a kind of philosophical position because it depends on whether you believe that system level thinking or system level dynamics can be understood from individuals, individual units. 
or you think uh, much like keynes who spoke about the fallacy of composition which suggests that the system has a different logic of its own and the individual has a different logic of its own and so therefore tradition such as classical political economy marxian economics which start with a class or a group or a social class then for i mean then cannot be easily absorbed into methodological individualism although there have been attempts to include uh, certain aspects of marxian economics or fuse methodological individualism with certain aspects of marxian economics so therefore i think from a pedagogic standpoint it is important that the student is aware that there are two kinds of philosophical standpoints methodological holism and methodological individualism and that people have tried to sometimes fuse together let's say methodological individualism with certain heterodox traditions so these kinds of synthesis has been attempted but irrespective of whether one agrees with uh, the success of the synthesis or not i think that it is important we acknowledge that there are two ways of going about doing economics one is methodological individualism and the other is methodological holism and in fact here i would not talk about macroeconomics but about microeconomics or the st- the theory of price you can have the theory of price or value both from a methodological holist standpoint as well as from a methodological individualist standpoint but unfortunately almost maybe 99.99% of the microeconomics textbooks only talk about methodological individualism the question for you is about environmental and ecology or uh, ecological economics from chapter 5 environment and ecology is one of the insignificant variables in modern day economics policy makers often follow a bandaid approach for the same still as an alternative we cannot abide by the philosophy of meadows and meadows in such a situation what is a perfect alternative to deal with the economy do you think a better distinction between could be provided between ecological and environmental economics in future editions yeah so if we think of environment and ecology i think the way in which i have uh, dealt with this is to talk more in the ecological sense and to think of it as a structural feature of the macro economy that it is important that we talk about the ecology from first chapter onwards and not keep it towards the very end right so i think that within what is possible within this tradition i have tried to do or within the scope of this book but i'm looking forward to uh, books which are going to come out from the classical keynesian tradition which is going to uh, integrate uh, the ecological aspect in a circular flow approach or within the strafian tradition so i'm waiting for more books which i know are being written on this so we'll see and i certainly think that we need to have a, a a structure or a systems level understanding or a kind of input output framework to better understand ecological issues because they are both inputs and outputs in all the kind of production that we are thinking of uh next question is about decolonizing economics which i believe is from the entire book the book revolves around the indian economy and it takes us through different fictional narratives what motivated you to author an economics book which is so indian and straightforward in nature uh so again when I, when i was writing the book um, i wanted as i mentioned i mean the approach that loosely that i followed was this theory context uh, measurement policy approach and when it came to the question of context uh, i i mean i contemplated whether i want to use let's say journal articles which uh, write about gender and caste particularly or land or i want to use which are what i would consider which are arising from some kind of lived experience and i decided that i would go with looking at fictional narratives which have a strong experiential element to it and also because otherwise economics does not pay much attention to let's say emotions and even somebody like uh, smith who's writing his theory of moral sentiments spoke about the importance of things like sympathy uh, respect or different kinds of moral sentiments and by my use of 
these kind of fictional narratives i also wanted to introduce moral sentiments as an important way to learn uh, economics as well as an important maybe end goal of learning economics so both these aspects were there and i believe i felt that it was only uh, fictional narratives which would provide this kind of flavor and not uh, scholarly journal articles or books which are written for a different audience so that was the reason and in terms of uh, my own narrative which you have labeled as straightforward i think when i was writing uh, i kept the student clearly in mind and uh, i didn't want to write in the usual way where uh, general kind of textbooks are written in a very closed way that when i'm reading the book i feel i don't feel a connect with the book or the author so when i was uh, writing i it was a conscious decision to use a style that is much not just accessible but also where the reader is connected to the text itself so uh, that was the reason and of course one does not know for sure whether it actually works until it works so i'm happy that it worked uh question 7 economics lies in the intersection of sciences and social science making is a prominent factor in decision making still sadly the policy makers cannot define the problem of downtrodden and i mean uh, nicoba tribes example in the book so how can we solve this problem which we incur during the pursuit of development this is from chapter 2 dilemma of policy makers yeah so uh, the way in which i talk about uh, policy making i mean i have these two chapters uh, policy objective of full employment and policy objective of low inflation and even when i'm talking about policy making i have titled the section as a prelude to the solutions now the reason i've taken this kind of a cautious um approach is because i believe that as i mean as academic economists or as economists who are working in public policy we can make certain recommendations but as i mentioned in my book as well in both in chapter 1 and the uh, chapter 9 it is extremely important that we also take into account what the people in that community want it is very easy for economists to think that this is good for everyone but i think that we have to resist this kind of a uh, attitude because ultimately the kind uh, any kind of policy making has to be a democratic one and it cannot be that economists are seen as experts who know everything and the people who are living there are just uh, listening to what we are saying and here i just want to maybe i mean uh, put forth a kind of um, conundrum that i have today we have a lot of data we have more sophisticated mathematical modeling but there was a point in time where people who were living in the forests and fishing or hunting had a certain understanding of nature and they did not have sophisticated models they did not have big data but there was a way in which they coexisted with nature while there was hunting but it was it was done in a sustainable manner right so people who are living in these context also have a lot of knowledge knowledge may not be in the same way as we understand it in scientific journals so when we take our knowledge elsewhere it is important we are also able to incorporate and be respectful and mindful and also you know include different kinds of knowledge systems that exist and then the decision i think has to be left to the people who are living in that particular area question 8 can we expect a new edition of the book which would deal with the discrimination and stratification of society so uh, while it is the case that i have engaged with the question of uh, caste discrimination and gender discrimination to some extent in the book i don't think that i have the knowledge or uh, the expertise to you know uh, engage with it even more that is one but secondly uh, i am actually working on a history of economic thought textbook which is taken priority so i don't know whether or when or if at all there will be a new edition so uh, currently i'm working on a history of economic thought textbook question 9 why do you think karl marx provides a mature treatment to the classical political economy 
Can you briefly explain the evolution of classical political economy to Marxian economy? This is from chapter one, Marxian economics. Yeah. So uh, even, I mean, I think that people or scholars who have studied uh, Marx and who uh, end up studying Marx. So I, I must say that there are two interpretations or two views on this. I have put together Marx along with Smith and Ricardo and Keynes. But there, there are also scholars who will not put together Marx along with Ricardo. Right? So there are people who believe that uh, Marx completely rejected classical economics. And there are people like me who think that uh, there, is, uh, there are some strong commonalities between the work of Marx and Ricardo and Smith. So if one thinks that, then, for instance, the work of Marx, especially the way he deals with monetary issues, I think certainly is a significant advance over what is there in uh, Smith and Ricardo, even on the question of what determines accumulation or to talk about underconsumption, there is a more mature treatment. But as I generally caution, this does not mean that in all aspects or there is no linear kind of progress possible. So for instance, Adam Smith is writing about the theory of moral sentiments. So you will not find a similar kind of you know, discussion in Marx. So just because I think Marx provided a mature treatment, that does not mean that we do not read somebody who wrote before him and who's critical like Smith or Ricardo. So that is the way in which I would understand this uh, question. So the next question is, the book has amazing sets of illustrations, especially the illustration which explains the evolution of economic school of thought in a glance. What motivated you to take up your students' illustrations in the book? Okay, so I think this question is a bit incorrect in the sense, no, it was not exactly that way. Uh, so what happened was that I was writing uh, a short piece for a magazine and I had asked in the class, uh, is there anyone who wants to illustrate for this um, uh, magazine and this article that I was writing? And uh, Sahana uh, had shared her illustrations and... So then I realized that uh, she's able to illustrate in a way which uh, communicates what I want to communicate, but through the use of visual metaphors and which has a strong power to it. So when I started uh, thinking about or when I started writing this book, I thought maybe it might be a good idea to bring in some illustrations into the book. And so I asked Sahana if she was willing to illustrate for the book. Uh, so and then we had this process where she would I mean, I would share the drafts and she would go through it and she would point out uh, illustration ideas Then I would respond to it. And so that's how we came up with us, uh, these set of illustrations uh, for the book. Of course, I mean, I can't uh, draw. And so it, all these illustrations are by Sahana. And I think that they also provide a different kind of entry point to understand economics or something like a visual metaphor. And Sahana's illustrations also are quite rich in their texture. So they are not uh, very simple ones. So I think with just like uh, when we watch a movie over and over again, or a text over and over again, we get new insights. I think Sahana's illustrations also are of a similar kind, where there is new kinds of meaning to be found in repeated readings. Thank you, Devika. Um, so, um, Hope our questions help audience understand the pluralistic nature of the book better. Uh, now we are it's time to take up some questions from the audience. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, Shobha, could you kindly read them out? Uh, sure, when I can. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, the first question is from Ask Me. Uh, like the question is, what do you think about the politicization of economic theory? Do you feel it can ever be objective? Okay, so let's let's probably, I mean, I'm trying to start. So if we take, I mean, one is that if you look at the history of economics itself, uh, the way in which we understand economics today, let's say starting with Adam Smith or going back to William Petty or Francois Kenney, it was largely really connected to the formation of the nation state. So William Petty, uh, is writing a treatise on taxes also at the same time that he is trying to uh, 
and the question of taxation is important because of the nation state so in a way political economy has always had strong connections with the state either through taxation or through public expenditure and then there is some notion of a collective so some notion of a collective always exists and then we are trying to think of what kind of interventions can be made and what are the important analytical categories so here certainly if we start by assuming that there are factors of production in the economy land labor capital uh and entrepreneurship and all of them are in par at par with each other we are assuming and we are presuming that there is no structural power in the economy at that level but whereas if you start from land owners capitalists and workers and it is claimed that land owners are more powerful than capitalists capitalists are more powerful than workers we are recognizing that power exists in the society so both of these are starting points in one in marginalist economics and other broadly in the political economy tradition and depending on how you conceptualize the economy you might want to assume away certain important characteristics characteristics of the economy or you might wish that the economy was like this now whatever cho- analytical choice that one makes it is certainly a political choice so something as simple as factors of production and social classes or i'll give another example in mainstream economics or mainstream labor economics we think of the labor market and the supply and demand for labor as determining wages and there is an inverse relationship between wages and the quantity of labor or the supply of labor so wage equals a function of labor and what this suggests is that if in a society the labor i mean there are a lot of workers it is legitimate for us to provide them low wages so it becomes an intellectual device of control even something as simple as a functional relationship between w and l which we are talking about in the labor market supply and demand supply and demand uh, conceptualizations even something as elementary as that has an important political implication and just to reiterate the implication is that in a labor rich uh, society like india this kind of an economic theory legitimizes low wages this is constructed by people right and markets are also designed and constructed by people and the rules of the market are also constructed by people so in that sense all these elements have a strong political uh, underpinning but very often the way in which these concepts like supply and demand of labor or the labor market are taught to us especially in microeconomics is as if it is devoid of political considerations and that is a dangerous kind of uh, assumption or dangerous kind of approach uh, we are approaching the co- uh, completion of one hour but like uh, devya could you please uh, uh, soba could you please uh, ask the last question also Uh, yes sir uh, d- uh, yes when i come the uh, sir the next question is from jayat joshi uh, his question is in this important work on pluralism you do support particular policy objectives like full employment as the correct ends of good economic theory can we consider this as characterizing your politics do you see a potential for reconciliation between pluralistic analysis and mainstream policy goals uh y- yes so i think that i mean i do think that full i mean full by full employment i'm also talking about decent wages and uh, good working conditions along with you know the, the general kind of understanding of full employment so all those go together and as to your question about uh, can we reconcile policy with pluralism so i think what pluralistic approaches uh, tell fundamentally it is about at the level of ideas and it is at the level of pedagogy that it communicates to both students and policy makers that there are different schools of thought and if one is aware of different schools of thought their interaction produces new kinds of knowing and new ways of looking at the world and then depending on one's politics or other reasons you might choose to adopt a particular policy conclusion now i think that it is possible by bringing in appropriate modifications to marginalist economics to arrive at some of similar policy conclusions as heterodox economics as well but the path to do that is slightly different 
so if you are exposed to certain kind of heterodox or radical politics it is possible that your policy conclusion will be similar to that in heterodox economics otherwise people who are studying it in general might not arrive at um, that kind of a uh, policy conclusion Uh, since we are approaching to the end, uh, any questions uh, further can be, uh, if you send to us, we'll forward it to Alex for sure. Um, so I, uh, to conclude, I call upon uh, uh, our, our, our core team members, Akshay, for the order of thanks. Uh, hello, uh, first of all, good evening, all. Uh, the job interested upon me is to thank everyone who is present here. And first of all, on the behalf of Kendraj Economics Club, I would like to thank the respected speaker, Professor Alexander Thomas, for introducing his widely acclaimed book and having an enriching Q and A session. Next, I would like to thank all the participants who have taken time to attend today's session and contributed positively towards the deliberations. And like uh, for one more note, our next session is on November 13, and the session will be carried out by Ankit Singh from JNU. On marks in economics, so hoping to meet you all soon on that session. Thank you. Uh, one more quick remark before we conclude. Uh, actually, uh, the uh, Cambridge Economics Club wishes to get this book to the libraries in various colleges and universities in Kerala. Uh, we'll try to seek funding from Breathing Economics International or other aid, uh, economic agencies internationally to promote that, uh, considering the plur uh, highly pluralistic nature. Uh, thank you, Alex, once again. Thank you so much.